Ay. Ay. <laughs> Metosha bani, metosha. Mtafanya nisahau. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon leaders. Afternoon leaders. Aki wameniseti. How do you come up after says? Ni <laughs> sawa. So, uh, um Storm Wabuko that's S T O M. Uh haina haina R. Unaweza niita we nitaitika. Okinita kwako pia nitakuja. So, I am a sp performing spoken word poet, musician and author and I run a Prisons Juvenile Reforms Mentorship Program in Committee. Uh, <laughs> where we we mentor the kids using art and the word of God and hopefully January 2022 with the help of our amazing magnificent father Godwin Mutai. <laughs> and our mother, Noel Mutai. <laughs> we, we, we are going to be starting an intentional and regular ministry in the prison. So we be, we've had several salvation stories, but next year, Sasa Tunongeza Mafuta and with the help of our Pasi. In my hand is my book, my first poetry book I've written. It's called Mira. In an a free EP. And this book here is a collection of poems written by the boys at Kamiti Prison. Ningependa ku gift two people this one. One gent and one lady. Mteote anataka hizi. So. What happened to you last night? How come you never called back? See, I was waiting for you on the same spot by the street light, but you never showed up. It was supposed to be a date night, not candlelit. The moon shone bright just the way you like, but I guess you never saw that. So what's the excuse this time? Oh, your phone was off. Oh, you couldn't find your shoe? Oh, the alarm never went on. Don't you know that wounds heal, but scars remain the same? The bleeding heart invites a beautiful kind of pain. My sacrifice sealed with a smile on my face. I went through hell and back withstanding its flames just to prove my life for you and fight for it with no shame. The threads that hold us together cannot be bound by time or space. It's past the tie between a shoe and a lace and it doesn't need no authenticity test because it's nowhere near fake. You see, for your sake, I caught and swallowed grenades for your sake. I ripped through that grave and took your place. And I saw you fall down, entangled in shame and doubt. Your intertwined passions and distinct personality made you suffer in doubt and guilt. And I saw him return triumphantly amidst the praises of his fellow fallen angels. You see, I understand. You made a vow to love the flesh of your flesh till death do you part. So it was only logical that you take a bite of that apple and disobedience. So I see the apple stuck in your throat, Adam. Don't you know? that there's nothing you could ever do to sway me, to separate me from you. Even in your wrong, I still write your future. Even in my throne, I still write your future. Don't you know that those Louis, Dochi and Gabbana suits can't hide you from my all-seeing eyes? Don't you know that I made beauty? I am beauty, so you don't need no makeup to face me. Stop hiding in your blue ticks. Please lift up the shade. I know you've been running for way too long, but it's time to take a rest. My word is true, and my word is life. When I forgive, I forget. See, you, you could never understand the cost of the price I paid on the cross, so you can learn to fly again. So please pick up your crown and fly again. Don't you know that you are a royal priesthood? 
that my blood runs in you. Don't you know that you walk with my name in your DNA? I parted the seas so you can learn to fly again. So please pick up your crown and live. Oh, wow. Come on, let's hear it one more time for Storm. Oh, my goodness. I just want to say there's a revival going on. Can you tell, we've been praying for rain for so long. Today is the day that it's raining. Somebody give glory to God. We bless the Lord for rain. Yes. Yes. For those in other countries, we're having a rainstorm here. We haven't had rain in so long. But the drought is over in Jesus' name. Look at that rain. Oh my gosh. Wow. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. I bless God for Lifeway. I bless God for Storm and for Hype Cess. Uh, I know these guys are doing some serious evangelism, reaching the next generation with their talents and skills. And uh, Hype Cess is starting, has an outreach every Saturday. And they go and dance with some young people in Kaha West and then share the gospel with them. It's like an outreach youth service. And we bless God for you. And then what's happening in Committee Prison as well, uh, we bless God for as well. Come on, let's appreciate them one more time. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Wow. I feel like the prophet Elijah at the end of the drought. The Holy Spirit checking in. Wow. <laughs> now I have to preach like an evangelist. Can you hear me at the back? All right, all right, all right. Amen. Well, um, first of all, just to say, I'm ex just the feedback I'm getting from different ones of you, I really believe the Lord is in the house. And just there was a lot of healing that happened in that last session. I just feel like God just really broke a lot of chains uh, and that they are, they are going to be powerful testimonies. Not even next year, actually this year, there will be powerful testimonies from different, in different campuses because of what God did in that last session. We want to talk a bit about the rhythms of the family. The rhythms of the family. So I'm going to keep asking you to re repeat, your, repeat what I'm saying to just make sure you're with me. The rhythms of the family. That's what we want to talk about right now. Every family has rhythms. Every family has things that they do that build their sense of family or should have rhythms. Uh, right now, my mom is trying to institute a rhythm for my family. Uh, she, every third Sunday, uh, like, tomo like tomorrow, she wants all her children home so that we can have, and fortunately she lives not far, so she wants us to be coming home so we can have lunch with her. Every I think it's second Saturday. Uh, Pastor Carol's mom, who lives also in Langata, not far, also gets all the children to come home so she can spend with them. That's a family rhythm. And she says, anybody who's my child, that day I want you in the house. And you know something? When families build rhythms, families stay together. There's something very powerful about her mom has a way of bringing the children together. That's very powerful because she wasn't always a believer. She, didn't grow, she became a believer after Pastor Caro. Actually, it's because of Pastor Caro that her family became Christians. And that's a legacy that is part of this house. Many of you, your parents will become Christians because of you. That is, that is something that I believe with all my heart. So because of that, I think her mom just, God had given her just a natural wisdom with children. There are many things that I really uh, appreciate about my mom-in-law. And one of them is ever since those days, like one Saturday every month, she just cooks for us. And she gets her children to just come and be in the house. And she is very smart. Even the grandkids, she finds out what do you like. And whatever she knows that child likes, she will make sure he's there. So even our kids don't miss. So you can imagine we just go there from around nine and we stay sometimes till five. We just seven. And we just sit, people talk. They watch, what's that thing that they watch? Zora. <laughs> it's, a, it's a soap opera. Uh, that's a Kenyan soap opera. I didn't even know about it, but mom is addicted, and so is my wife now becoming. So they watch Zora, and then we talk. So people come in, they go and play golf, they come back, we hang out, 
and it's a rhythm, and what the rhythm does, it keeps the family together. So that's what rhythms do. If, you have, if you're a parent, you need to think through what are your rhythms. What are the things you do with your family that keep the family together? So for us, every Friday night is family night. So we try as much as we can when everybody's around that we get people together, we'll either have dinner and watch a movie, or we'll play a game, or we'll just talk. And that's a way that in a busy family with teenagers, that's one of the ways we bring everybody together. We've done it for years. Uh, that's a rhythm. So what are your family rhythms? What are the rhythms you institute? Uh, we, 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 every evening when we sit down to have supper, we sit together and everybody shares a highlight and a low light of their day. We just go around and we just share. And they look forward to that, by the way. We all look forward to it. That's a family rhythm. What are the family rhythms that you have? Now, in a spiritual family, there are also rhythms. There are also things that we do as a family that God institutes for us that keep us together but also help us to become effective in the role that God has called us to. And today we want to talk about the rhythms that God has called us to in this season. Now, these rhythms, they sound obvious, but they weren't obvious to me. If you want to have a church that becomes a global movement, and, and the reason you want to have a church that becomes a global movement is not because of the... Somebody once told me this very powerful thought. He said, never measure the size of your ministry by the size of your ego. Measure the size of your ministry by the size of the harvest. So if you've been put in a place where there are many, many people who are dying, having a small church is a sin. Having a small ministry is a sin because the harvest is plentiful. Amen. So for us, as we look at the lost generation, our friends, our peers, the generation that doesn't know God, it's a global generation. And so we want to have a global ministry to reach those people. But if you want to do that, you have to, have a, to build a family. And if you want to build a family, you have to have rhythms that connect you as a family. So when you go to Mavuno Berlin, you find the rhythms. When you go to Mavuno Lusaka, you find those rhythms. And they tell you, this is who we are. This is what we do as a family. So I want to just share some rhythms for us. And by the way, I want to give credit here. These rhythms were taught to us by Apostle Moses Mukis of Worship Harvest. And I really honor him as a brother, as somebody who I love very much, and who has really taught me a lot in this season. And so I just want to share that. And he, taught, he learned them in turn from Pastor Doug, uh, Bishop Doug Hayward of Lighthouse Chapel, a large global multiplying movement based in Ghana. Um, remember, you follow who you become. And so it's important that you follow the people who are going where you're going. So these, these rhythms are, are rhythms that we're following. And the first one, and, and let me just say where they come from. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to, to 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. And here is what it says. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes ate together with good and sincere hearts, glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. So, so this is the early church. It's an exciting church. It's a happening church. Everybody wants to be in this church. The Spirit of God is moving. And there's some great rhythms that this church has that I think are very powerful. The first one is prayer. Is prayer. These guys were devoted to prayer, the Bible tells us. They had a, a long prayer meeting in the upper room. Jesus had told them, go to Jerusalem and wait uh, for power to come on high. So they went and they sat in a room and they waited for power to come and they had a prayer meeting. And in the middle of this long prayer meeting, the Holy Spirit comes down. One of the things that's interesting about this rhythm of a family, it's such an important thing for a Christian. Of course, Christians should pray. And of course, pastors should pray. That's such an important thing. Amen. Amen. Of course we should. The question is how much we actually pray. And when I, when, I when I started listening to this, I realized I pray a lot less than Mavunites think I pray. <laughs> Most pastors pray a lot less than their church think they pray. Um, I wake up early. I've always woken up early. And I've been an early riser since we got, before we got married. And I always have my quiet time. But I realized I would spend maybe even an hour reading God's word. And then sometimes I'd even spend 15 minutes praying. 
And one of the things that Bishop Doug said that really struck my mind, he says, every Christian, I don't think he read this in the scripture, but I think he just made a rule for himself, which I think is a very good rule. He said, every Christian, a real Christian, should pray at least one hour a day. One hour. At that point, I was convicted. I said, okay, I need to become a Christian because I wasn't praying one hour a day. And then he said, a pastor should be praying three hours a day. I said, okay, let me just be a Christian for now. <laughs> let me start. Let me take baby steps. Amen. Let me just start where I am. And so I remember at that point that we actually began to realize our primary work is prayer. Now, it's interesting because as Christians, many times, and as Mavunites, we are very strategic people. We have plans. We can sit and strategize. We can sit and think. We can sit and plan and come up with amazing systems and strategies. And we're known for that. We're a fantastic, and it's a gift of God. I believe it's a mark of this house. But sometimes it's very easy to miss the fact that the actual work is prayer. The work that we do is empowered by prayer. You can do a lot of planning, but without prayer, that planning only gives you man's results. God's results come through prayer. Now, I'm teaching the choir. All of you know this. I'm not teaching you something you don't know. But you know, when you read the scripture, you find in Isaiah 26 verse 9, it's, uh, the prophet says, In the night I search for you. So this thing of praying at night, it's not something that just began the other day. In the night I search for you. David says that a lot of times. I seek you. Uh, he, he talks about seeking God in the night. Blessed are those who seek God in the night. So, Solomon even talks about that. He says, in the morning, I earnestly seek you. For only when you come to judge the earth will people learn what is right. So this guy, Isaiah, his job was just to seek God. He's like, people need to know what God, is, what God wants. People need to know what is right. God needs to come. And people need to know what's right. And so what is his solution? I pray. I seek God. I go to God at night. I don't, it's not about preaching. It's about seeking God. Something really powerful. You know, when I went to uh, with, I, I'm trying to think which of these pastors was there. Maybe none of these was there. I remember Pastor Njoro was in the team, Pastor Kevin. We went to Nigeria uh, in 2020, just before the, the COVID lockdown. And we had the opportunity to go and visit RCCG, Redeemed Christian Church of God, one of the biggest and fastest growing uh, churches in the world today. Uh, they have churches in over 100 countries. Uh, Actually, they have churches in every country of the world right now, currently. A hundred countries was the last time I checked. I mean, they're insane. They plant churches like, like people have food. You know, it's like they just plant churches. I think it was on the bishop's 70th birthday that they presented him the birthday gift of we are now in every country. That's the gift. May it happen to me in Jesus' name. Amen. And imagine the guy, what happened is we went into the place. They have a church that is insane. Some of you remember I told you this story. You can't click until you're there. Because you first drive, and you drive, and you drive. So maybe from the gate of Hill City, Hill City, you drive all the way till here. That is the children's sanctuary. The children's church. For the adults' church, the youth church, in fact, I remember taking a video, and we're in a car driving. You actually drive for a while. And then you get to the, to the front of the church, and that's a youth sanctuary. You can't see someone at the back. It's, 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 it's actually like a kilometer long. They've got speakers and screens over and over and over and over and over. I tried walking to the back. I couldn't. I got tired. And I came back. Like, it's insane. And then they tell you, this is a youth the adult one is three kilometers by three kilometers. Okay, I can see the blank faces. You see, you don't get it. You actually have to see it because it, it, it just numbs your mind. In fact, I remember laughing. Like, you're like, this is ridiculous. Like, nobody should dream like this. The bishop's vision is that their church, I can't even believe him, their church sanctuary will be the size of Ibadan. Ibadan is the second largest city by area in Africa. So his vision is that they will be the size of Ibadan. And they will have a satellite on the moon to broadcast stations across. You're like, seriously? By the way, it sounds ridiculous until you see what they do. When they have a conference, they have, they have 4 million people. That's Nairobi's population. And that's because their compound is 1,000 acres. 
Okay, I can see I lost Mavuna. It's a long time ago. I, I, lo I left you at the children's sanctuary. <laughs> so, but here's the thing that struck me. We got to hear our little, uh, we talked to somebody who was very close to a bishop. And he told us something very interesting. He told us that for the longest time, for years, this man wakes up every morning, every, I don't think you can call it morning, he wakes up at 11 o'clock at night and he prays till 4. That has been his ritual. He walks around the city and he, it's like he just walks and prayer walks. Like it's such a big thing that people even walk at night hoping to see the bishop. Like because they know he's somewhere. He just walks anywhere. And he just prays and prays and prays. How many hours is that? 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 5 hours every day. Yet that man has accomplished more than almost any pastor alive. So, so, so here's the thing. Here I am so busy. I'm like, man, the church has to grow. There's so much work to do. Lord, let me give you 15 minutes so I can do the work. But guys, prayer is the work. Prayer is the work. And that's what this guy, prayer is the work. Yonggi Cho, some of you know Pastor Yonggi Cho. He just passed on. He had one of the largest churches, if not the largest church in the world. I think Pastor Ndachi, you're telling us about it. Do you know how many guys were in that church? A million people. Like in a building. Again, I've lost you. You see, you have to actually go around the world and see some big things. Otherwise, you'll be thinking your village has the big things, you know. So it's important for you to understand there are people who dream big. And again, Yonggi Cho, when he was asked when he was old, what was his biggest regret in life? He says he only prayed three hours a day. Like all his life, he's only prayed for three hours a day. He wished he prayed more. I was like, my goodness. What's happening here? What are we doing wrong? What is it that we're missing? There's something we're missing. And so this lack of prayer, it hinders our growth. It hinders our ability to see breakthrough. It hinders our, our opportunity to see demons running away from us. One of the things I didn't tell you about these kids, they all wake up. All these young kids, 10 years, 9 years, 5 years, all of them wake up at 5 and pray for an hour. Imagine if you started praying at five years old for an hour, what would have happened in your life by now? Like you'd be walking in the gate, we just feel tremors. <laughs> we just be like anointing is in the house. I mean, that's what they do. No wonder a child can walk somewhere and the demon starts saying, my judge is coming. My judge is coming. There's results when we pray. Luke chapter 5, 5 verse 16. He says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Often. By the way, by the time you're withdrawing to the wilderness, it's not like a quick prayer. That's a, a season of prayer. He would often go just to pray. Matthew chapter 1, verse 35. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up, went out to an isolated place to pray. Jesus did not wait for the light to come up. He prayed when it was still dark. It's biblical. If you sleep until the sun comes up so that you can pray, you're not biblical. <laughs> He prayed early in the morning. That's what he did. And he prayed and he had results. You want the results of Jesus, isn't it? So you follow hard. You do what he did. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. It says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles. Like, when you're choosing somebody to work in your department, how long do you pray? I mean, he prayed a whole night. A whole night. No wonder these men went on to become significant leaders who changed the world. Because he didn't just pick them. He prayed a whole night and trusted God to show him who to pick. Wow. wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. When was the last time you prayed a whole night for a HR decision? Those of you who are in HR, ben <laughs> Bernard, sorry to pick on you. When was the last time you prayed a whole night? Because you knew I have an important decision to make that will affect the future of this company. That's Jesus. This is what he was doing. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Being watchful and thankful. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. You know, I'm a Martha, not a Mary, I must confess. Any Marthas in the house? Yeah, yeah, we know how to serve. I'd rather be in the background getting things to happen. 
Martha missed, was missing the point. Mary knew something bigger. Mary knew something greater. She went and abided with Jesus. Any Marys in the house? Prophetically, anybody who's going to be a Mary in the house? Yeah. This is this season. We're going to see results like we've never seen results. But the results will not come by running faster. They'll come by actually resting. They'll come by waiting on God. Some of you have been praying for some serious career breakthroughs. Let me tell you, the career breakthrough is not by impressing. It's by praying. As you wait on God, yes, be diligent at work. But don't neglect spending time in, with your father. Your father will actually promote you to where you're supposed to be. And the beauty when God promotes you is you don't work for a boss, you work for God. And you're not afraid of any man. When you know your father, you walk into a company, you work there, and you know the day that the one who hired me fires me, I leave. So whatever you guys say, that's good for you, but I'm here to do a mission. And guess what happens with people like that? Those are the valuable employees. Bosses like people who are not there, intimidated and trying to impress. They like people who know themselves. And sometimes you're so busy trying to please your boss, you don't understand. Actually, you're actually hurting yourself. When you know who you are, boom. I remember one of my friends used to work for a bank. And he, it was such a crazy work schedule. Like if you try to wake up out of your seat before 7 p.m., people look at you badly. Like who the heck do you think you are? You're living before your boss. And the CEO of this bank, who shall, I shall not name, would live at 9. So he expected all his employees to live at 9. Needless to say, his marriage was broken. But it's like, that's, that's not important for him. He hired you to work. And I remember we prayed with our brother. And at some point, we said to him, you need to know who you are. You need to know who you are. You cannot do this. Your marriage is important. Your faith is important. So he went to the bank and he resigned without even knowing where he was going. He was like, this is not what my father's assignment is for me. And so he resigned and he went home. Like the next day, literally, he got a letter from a competing bank offering him the job at a higher salary. He told them, I'll only work for you on this condition, this condition, this condition. They said, yes, sure. And so he went and he got a job. He knew who he was. So here's the best thing that happens in this story. His former boss was so angry, so angry, that the guy could work for a competitor. He had a meeting with him. He told him, we need to have coffee. And they had coffee. And the guy said, how dare you go work for the competitor? The guy said, look, things weren't working for me. He said, I will double your salary. Come back. He said, I don't need a double salary. I was not seeing my family. Your family, your workplace is destroying my family and I don't have time for my faith. On that basis, I can't work for you. The guy told him, come back. What time do you want to leave the office? Six. That's done. You can be the only one. Just leave. How much money do you want? This much. Done. Come back. The guy got his old job at a higher pay rate and he got the hours. He'd wake up, the only one in the office. He had a special letter from the MD and just go home. Because he knew who he was. Are you understanding? Sometimes we think, if I hustle more, I'll go farther. And the, the song says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so in this season at Mavuno Church, we're praying. We're coming in early to pray. Every morning at 4.30. 4.30 to 5.30. In all our campus networks. We have prayer time. Oh my goodness, it was a struggle for some of us. Some of us are not morning people. We are never, we've never been morning people, but we leaned in. God began to, to work through us not being morning people. By the way, some of us are now morning people. Like I said, I'm not even looking at my wife right now, but some of us are serious morning people. We are living in the area of miracles. By the way, when you start seeing miracles, you become a morning person. Now, let me say this. I don't want to create a cultic teaching here. I don't believe God is answering our prayers because we pray in the morning. That was actually just say tongue in cheek. Uh, I don't think you're a sinner if you don't pray in the morning. That's not what I'm saying. I don't even think it's the hour. I don't think it's the hour we picked that is the magic. I believe it is the fact that we picked an hour and that we followed that hour. We were all praying individually. We are all doing our independent thing. But the minute we all said we are aligned, this is a time that has been said, we are all praying. Miracles began to happen. We've seen, my wife and I have seen miracles everywhere. Hey, I tell you, we've seen them. They have happened in our family. They have happened in our finances. They're happening around us. And I know many of you can testify about miracles happening in your prayer meetings. So this prayer thing 
I believe it's part of the rhythm that keeps us together. It's a joy for me to know every morning when I wake up, there are people praying in Berlin. There are people playing in Lusaka. There are people, even Mavunites who have traveled to Qatar are joining our prayer meetings. And they're praying in the morning. There's something powerful in God. And you know what's happening? There's a spiritual force being re released right now. I remember we're talking with our pastors and saying, at some point we went through a very serious spiritual attack the last couple of weeks. And we're wondering, why is this? Then we realize, my goodness, you, you're playing at a, high, a different level spiritually right now. Because God's people are joining in concerted prayer every morning and seeking the face of God. Guess what happens when you start to do that? God has more room to walk in the church. He has more room to operate. Now, I have so much enjoyed prayer, guys. It's been such a delight. Like, I feel like God has revived my faith. He's revived my passion for ministry. Like, I wake up, my wife can tell you, <laughs> I, I used to, like, I was waking up at four. And then I'd read the word, etc. We said, we said, I still woke up at four for a while. But I just feel my, like, and I kept saying, I used to wake up at three when I was young. Now I'm waking up at four. But as I grow older, it'll move to five and then six. Because I've done my time, and now I'm growing old. You guy, let me tell you, the Bible says he renews your strength like an eagle. Like, I'm, I'm waking up at three now without an alarm clock. Like, my body just wakes up. And I find myself praying, and I don't even pray in the house. May I pray outside? Because I can tell you. I go outside. And the reason I go outside is because I'm like, I'm the man of the house. There are demons outside. I know there are none in the house because the house has been prayed for by my wife. But outside, somebody has to face the demons out there. So I walk around the estate. I just pray. I call out. There's a, Muslim, there's a mosque. And I'm just like, they're claiming that there's no other God except so-and-so. And so-and-so and -so is his prophet. I'm like, no, in Jesus' name, the only God is Jehovah. And I declare that over my neighborhood. And by the way, I just find that I want my voice to be the first voice declaring that over the earth. I pray that God's kingdom would come in our house. God's kingdom would come in our neighborhood. God's kingdom would come in my city. I, by the way, I've enjoyed it. I go into the throne room, and every morning I always feel like a little child. Uh, the picture I always have, I've told my exec team this, when I pray, I feel like a little child. Because I remember my dad had an important job once. And he had a big office. And my primary school was next to his office. And he was the big shot, but you know, I didn't know he was a big shot. So me, sometimes I'd walk into his office without knowing, and the secretary is not there. Hi, daddy. And he's in a meeting with big shots. Like, he was a real big shot, by the way. Uh, he was a director of broadcasting for the whole country when it was VOK, and it was one station. So he was a guy who determined what Kenyans watched, basically. So don't blame me for Dunia Wiki, he, you old young guys. <laughs> but, but, but I'd walk in, and then I'd be like, hi, daddy. And he'd be like, oh, come, come. And he'd give me a hug and just sit over there. And then he'd continue with matters of state. And I'd be like, wow. No other child in the country can sit here, except me. And I have full right to be here. In fact, he'd even call the caterers and say, just bring a drink for my son. And I'd be brought tea. I just sit there drinking, listening. Sometimes I take out my school books. Issues of national importance are being discussed. And I'm there because I am a son. So in the morning when I wake up and I go into the throne room nowadays, I just say, I'm your son, Lord. And I always think in the throne room of heaven, the mighty angels. You know those ones you can't describe, the ones that have eyes everywhere, even like those ones, the wheels within wheels and all that. And God sits there with his cabinet and they're deciding which country is about to be, which person is about to be disposed, which, which disease is about to be whatever. And I'm like, okay, God, hey, daddy, I'm here. What's up? And he stops everything for me. Oh, so good. And I come and I'm like, you are so amazing. I love you, daddy. You're incredible. And I tell him about how hallowed he is. And we start doing that, you know, that acts thing. It stopped being a formula for me because I'm like, adoration, I can take the whole time in prayer just adoring him. And it's like, man, you're so good. You're so awesome. Like, just look what you did yesterday. And I just don't even want to clap for you. You are amazing. And I just enjoy him. And then I talk about, okay, Lord, I also know that I've come in with muddy shoes. You know that sometimes in school you've been playing football and then you've entered the cup place. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I also recognize I've got sin and there are things around me that are not pleasing to you. So I just pray, forgive me, Lord. And I just go into just forgiveness. And I pray, fill me with, my, with your Holy Spirit. Make me holy. Make me like you. Bring me revival. And I pray, by the way, I just find myself getting lost in that. And then I go into Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for me is like a diary. I start with, now yesterday. Remember when we talked in that meeting? Now here's what happened. I went and I went to the gym. And I lifted. By the way, I lifted a weight I've never lifted. Thank you. That was your strength. By the way, there's nothing too small for God. And I say, when I talked to Carol and she gave me that throw, she threw that idea. It was so amazing. And thank you, first of all, that we are peaceful right now. We stopped that fight we are having. It's just you, Lord. You're so amazing. And I just go through my day, day, moment by moment. By the way, that can take me another whole prayer time. 
I have to stop myself. And then I go into my, my, my intercession. In my intercession time, I pray. I told you, I pray. I pray for, I have categories I pray for. I always pray for one of my family members every day. So it starts with Pastor Carol. Then I pray for Moini. Then I pray for Erimo. Then I pray for Anjao, my children. I have to pray for each of them. Every day they have their own day, specific day. And I pray for my parents and I pray for Carol's parents. That's tier one. Tier two is my siblings. And so I pray for my niece, Jane. And then I pray for Mutahi and Rosalind. And then I pray for Erimo and her husband, Richard. And then I pray, I mean, it's like I come, and then I pray for Carol's siblings, Edward and Mugore. And, I, and, I, and then every, each of them, by the way, has their own day. Nobody enters another person's day because I can really pray for them intently. And then after that, I go into my team. These are my next tier of my, my family here. And Pastor, Pastor Jemo and Dorcas have their day. Pastor Kilonzi and Faith have their day. And I pray for their marriage. I pray for their children to be great. I pray that they will love God with all their hearts. I pray that they will just have a fantastic marriage, that people will just love them. And I pray everything that I can think of for them. And I just cover them with prayer. And I love doing that, by the way. By the way, when I pray for them, I just feel more love. Like there's something when you pray for somebody, you just feel love for them. When you meet them, you just, it's like you've been with them, talking to your father about them. And then I pray after that, I pray for, uh, and I pray for every pastor under them. So if it's Pastor James and Dorcas that day, I pray for their network pastors and cover them as well. And then after that, I pray for the nation. And each, I've got a different issue. I pray for the president one day and the executive. I pray for the judiciary. My goodness, Martha Komesh, they know me, but I'm her biggest prayer warrior. I, I pray for the parliament and all their issues. I pray for cor against corruption. I pray for against tribalism. I've got my pet issues, and I cover those, and I always feel Kenya is covered. Uh, by the time I'm done, I'm like, nothing is going to destabilize this country. I'm here, and I've spoken for it. Not on my watch. And then after that, I finally get to my issues. Can you see how long th that prayer time is even finished? I even usually I'm like, okay, God, by the way, remember that issue of mine, please sort, because I don't even have time. I need to go to the gym now with my wife. It's like time has finished. And so what I found is slowly, more and more, the Lord is just waking me earlier and earlier. Today I woke up at two. So I'm slowly becoming a pastor. It's like I started as a Christian, but I'm slowly becoming a pastor. And so guys, I want to encourage you, because this is your season when you want to see breakthrough. This is the season when you want God to use you and make you part of this powerful family. Listen, the minimum anyone in this room should be praying is one hour a day. One hour a day. Yeah. Like some of you, the guys at the back are not saying amen. They're like, Ooh. what? And by the way, when I talk about prayer, me, I don't read the word during that prayer time. I read it first, and then I come and I pray for an hour. Because as I've just described you, there's too much to pray for. There's just too much to cover. And I feel like if I miss a day, I feel bad. Because I'm like, no, nah, I have to pray twice as long. There are things I can't I can't. For my kids, by the way, I've just talked about the, I don't even tell you, like in each category there are issues. I have to pray for their schooling, I have to pray for their future spouse, I have to pray for my in-laws, because of course you can have a good spouse and then they come from a home where the in-laws are just bringing us issues. Me, I pray that our in-laws will actually become our best friends. So I pray for them and then I pray that, uh, by the way, these kids are so prayed for. I pray for their, the fruit of the spirit to be in their lives, I pray for good friends. Hey, man. This prayer thing is amazing. And then by the time my day starts, my work is done, by the way. Many times I just find God just opens doors. Since I started praying this long, I've just found that there are times I used to take maybe two days to prepare a message. Sometimes I'll actually find I sat down and in four hours the message was complete. And God just gave me the word exactly as he wanted it given and that was it. Prayer is the work. Prayer is the work. My prayer for you, Mavuno, is that you will fall in love with prayer. Prayer is not an intercessor ministry in this church. Prayer is the ministry. It is us. We pray. We pray. I'll give you, I mean, they're powerful stories. Every, of these, every one of these pastors has stories. Pastor James told me about a, a, a woman who came to the service. I think it was in Hope, huh? Uh, came to the service in a wheelchair. And, oh, in crutches, sorry. And she had been lame for a long time. I think she had had an accident or something. And did you guys just pray for her? So they just prayed during the Sunday service, in our Swahili service. The woman walked without her crutches. She left this church walking and leaping and praising God. <laughs> Guys, we're, we're actually living in the age of miracles. I can tell you stories, miracle stories. I mean, I remember Pastor Godwin was sharing one another day. Pastor Kilonzi shared one another. I mean, people just share in the WhatsApp group and you're like, what? I think you were sharing. Was it you who was sharing? Who, who shared a crazy one the other day? Uh, it was the one for, from Nyamu and uh, Nyamu. 
Nyamu, Pastor Kelonzi shared your testimony. Of course, they tell, they tell on you. They tell on their children to their father. And what was the story? Come on, Nyamu, just do it. Nyamu, where are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the story? Just shout it out. Oh, there's a mic coming. Thank you. Nyamu is one of the pillars at Mavuno downtown. <laughs> and she oversees, she oversees a whole zone of different di discipleship group leaders. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Pastor M. Uh, so we went on an evangelism walk with my husband, Joe. So as we were walking and we had the kids, it was just before lunchtime. So we met this guy, he was drunk, he was dirty, he had a broken hand. So we saw him, he came, he's like, uh, can you buy me some food? We're like, we don't have any money. But since we're going home to cook, um, come in 30 minutes. Uh, no, we asked him, do you want us to pray for you? He was like, no, 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 just give me money. Wow. We're like, no, we, we can't give you money. And then we, we told him, we want to pray for you because we can see you're drunk. We could like to pray against alcoholism. Then he goes like, me, I'm not drunk. And you guys, he was drunk. So then we told First him... First of all, who tells somebody drunk, come, to, come home with you? <laughs> Let's, you lost me there. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, I love so it. So we, we didn't think he was going to come. So we went, uh, then we served. Then the guard came and told us, uh, he's here. So we served him food in our to-go, and then now Joe went. So then he's like, can I pray for you? He was like, okay, fine, just to pray. So he asked him, do you want to get saved? I was like, okay, fine, I'll get saved. So he gets saved. Then Joe asked him, can I pray for you so that you stop drinking? He's like, fine, I'll pray. Then he asked him, what else can I pray for you? So he had this knee. It was really swollen, you guys. He had a weird limp about it. So he's limping, his knee is really swollen. So he's telling us, um, my knee, I think he fell, but it's really swollen, it's been messed for a while. He actually can't go to the bathroom. So he had even poo poo on his knee, it was really what? gross. And he's really, really stinking and dirty. So we say, okay, fine, let's pray. Then our God, we had also led him to Christ like three weeks before. So we call him, we're like, come. So we are there, then Joe starts praying. You guys, this guy got healed in, and it was crazy. He was in utter shock. He started jumping, he started kicking the fence. The knee that was swollen, which was so, so creepy, was that the knee that was swollen was no longer swollen. Wow. As in, he was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so he's running, he couldn't even squat. He's squatting, he's standing up. His face was utter disbelief. Wow. Now we are all shocked. You, you guys are shocked. <laughs> no, 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 like, like, this thing is really, and the thing is, miracles are happening. Yeah. And it was so awesome just to be, like to see one, you know, just to see it. Wow. It was so, so good. Miracles everywhere. Hey, everywhere. Guys, this is what's happening. It's happening in Mavuno. It's happening in a campus near you. God is at work. And he's actually bringing some serious miracles. People are being healed. Like there's dramatic things that are happening. Uh, and we bless God for that. Uh, Pastor James was telling us about the, the, the witch doctor, the, the witch who, there's a woman who came, or bees, when you guys had bees, they actually got an attack of bees in, the Hope, in Hope Church. I think there's a lot of drama there. Uh, bees just came before the service and just occupied the place. Now, I'm a beekeeper. Bees don't do that. I can tell you that was not how bees behave. So they came and they prayed and they prayed. And I think those are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so they usually, at Hope Church is a Swahili uh, campus that meets here within this property. Uh, so anyway, so their service starts it's, an It's hour. what we used to call Mavuno Swahili. It's what we used to call Mavuno Swahili. Church, yeah. yeah, so, you know, they, their service starts an hour before, so I got, we, we come in early to pray. So Pastor Jerry had gotten here before me, he called me and told me we have a problem. So... I said, okay, I'm on my way, I'm coming to pray. So I came and one of the speakers was, like they had formed a hive, which, I mean, that doesn't happen, the way you're saying, it doesn't happen like in a day or two. Uh, and so there was an infestation the week before, but now they had formed a hive in one speaker. They were forming another one in the second one. Their associates were, like they were just waiting to know what to do. Together with the Reverend Cheche, who's the pastor there, we just called guys, we told them, okay, let's pray. I think this is obviously spiritual. So we started to pray. Uh, so the weird thing is that the, one of the speakers, I don't know where at what point those beats went. They were no longer there. Uh, 
and you know there were lots of bees dead on the on the on the platform as we were praying and we kept praying and then at some point thank you so much sure. change mic one two all right yeah so so yeah, so after we prayed, we just said, you know what, uh, we've said a prayer of faith, and I just told the Lord, nobody's going to get stung today in Jesus' name. And then I told the associates, just carry the speaker, take it outside somewhere where it won't go to kids' church or Mavuno Young and Fearless. They picked it, they took it, nobody got stung, and the service happened. Wow. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I just thought of these guys, they're so, they're so spiritual. You see bees, instead of calling a bee remover, you start praying. And the crazy thing, you start praying, bees are dying. Yeah. Like, that is not, it's not the thing. It's just, it doesn't happen. But again, just spiritual activity, heightened spiritual activity, as people of God begin to pray. And I really believe that God is going to do some powerful things uh, in, in, in this church, in your churches, as we just lean in and begin to pray by faith. I, I, I can see miracles happening that will astound us, that will astound us in this season. So the first rhythm for this family is prayer. You know, sometimes we, th we, we over-specialize prayer. We see it as a category for intercessors. We see it as a category for people who really have an inclination to pray. But prayer is not, uh, it's, that's not the way it was intended. Prayer is for every believer. I'm the vine, you're the branches. That's what Jesus says. You have to abide in me. As we abide in him, then he's able to come and do what he's supposed to do among us. And I feel, I feel like in this season, across the world, if we want to be that united family where God does incredible things, we will have to be a family that prays. I'm so glad we no longer pray just at worship night together once a month, but we're praying every day. Now, in, 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 in December, we're going to take a break from our Zoom prayers. Um, and the reason I'm insisting we take a break in December, in April, and in August is because we also need to pray, learn to pray by ourselves. And so the break is not for you to sleep. <laughs> I'm still expecting Mavunite. Wherever there's a Mavunite at 4.30, sometime there, somebody's awake and is praying. Because it's time for you to also learn to enjoy your father in that space. And when we come back, I'm expecting us to come back in January with even bigger testimonies uh, as we're trusting God together. Amen. So, and, and let me just encourage you, bring people into those Zoom prayers. Some of your disciples are not praying with us yet. So invite people in. They're missing out. They're missing out on the great things God is doing in this family. So prayer is the work. Number two is evangelism. Uh, and and that's, that's the next rhythm that, we will, that we've learned. Uh, it's interesting, when the Holy Spirit came uh, at Pentecost, and the disciples were all waiting, as we read in, in Acts chapter 2, Peter did not preach a sermon on finances. He didn't preach a sermon on marriage. He didn't preach a sermon on, on anything else. He preached an evangelistic sermon. That was the first thing. His instinct was just to preach about Jesus. And the Bible says 3,000 people were added to them that day. There's something powerful when God's people begin to align themselves with, with reaching people who don't know God. There's a reason God has blessed Mavuno over the years, people. And I remember one time, I think I've shared this story before, there's a pastor who came to visit Mavuno. She, uh, he, this pastor, I won't even mention who it was, but this pastor is a powerful preacher. And I'd invited them to come and do a, a sermon. And they did the sermon. But at the end of the message, this pastor came up to me and said, with all humility, I've heard a lot about Mavuno. And when I came, I expected to find, actually, he didn't say that. He just said, I, ex I, I was expecting a lot. But he says, I didn't see anything special. What's your secret? Now, of course, first of all, I had to swallow. We didn't see anything special. I guess he was expecting to come and find some fire-breathing intercessors and some powerful... He didn't see anything special. He just asked. So he was wondering, why is this church growing? Why are you rocking the city? Why is God doing such things among you and you're just ordinary people? But you know why I believe God has blessed Mavun over the years? It's because we are aligned to reaching the people God wants to reach. The Bible says the Son of Man did not come on earth to look for those who already have him. He came for, for the ones who already have a doctor. He, he came to look for the sick he came to look for the people who don't have him. Jesus' heart is for that person who is asleep in Great Wall Estate, gardens, when the service is going on. That's, his heart is there. He's longing to see that person come home. He's a real father. He's like, okay, I'm so happy with my children that they're here. But there are others who are not here. Let me tell you, if you're a parent and two of your kids are home and they're doing well and there's one who's messed up, your heart will not be at peace. You'll be looking at these ones and you're rejoicing in them. It's not that you're not rejoicing. 
But as a parent, that child is still your child. And your heart will be restless until that child comes home. The business of the father is the business of reaching the lost. So if you want to be in the father's heart, if you want to be that disciple who's always where God is, then you have to align your heart with sharing his word, with bringing people to him. You have to start learning to love the people who don't love God. That's evangelism for you. That's exactly what it means. It just means bringing people. Now we've always, again, like prayer, we've, we've, we've sort of put this ministry in a category. We've sort of placed it for those guys who just stand in matatus, preach. They don't care about people. You can throw them out. They'll just enter the next matatu and they'll preach. Those sanguine guys who are just bold. That's, we, 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 and I think we miss the point. That's not necessarily what evangelism is. Evangelism is just your heart changing another person's heart. It's you finding a solution and sharing your solution. By the way, I'm that kind of person. I don't know how many are like me, but when I find something that works, I like telling people about it. Like now everybody who knows me knows I go to the gym. It's, I'm that person. By the way, I'm, I just can't keep something good to myself. I'm like, you need to know that I go. And you should be also working out. My, 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 my poor executive, anything I do, I'm like, you need to do it. Like I share. And it's because I'm excited about it and what it's doing for me. If you found something that was life-giving, if you found something that you knew, this thing, it'll, cure, it'll keep me and keep me safe from COVID, like a plant somewhere in your shags, and it's a, you just find it and just take it and you are immune from COVID, surely you'd be a witch by keeping it to yourself. Yeah, at least your family should have it. At least your mother or your father and your brothers, if nobody else, surely for you to keep it to yourself would just be witchcraft, isn't it? You would despise a person like that. You'd say, what foolishness is this? What bewitched this person? How do you find life and keep it to yourself? But isn't that how we are as Christians? Yes. Like you have life. You have that thing that immunizes people, not from COVID, but from spiritual eternity, death without God. Wow. You have it. Wow. And yet people are dying around us. People are dying around us. Isn't that witchcraft of the highest order? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's how we are. And myself included, by the way. Myself included. And so I believe that God is calling us to align our hearts with his heart, to become passionate about the things that he is passionate about. And so we began uh, doing evangelism. When we, when we learned this, we were here with our pastors, we were doing a gathering, and so we decided let's all walk into Great Wall and just share. And I, I taught them something that I learned a long time ago. I don't, I, I'm not that guy who knows how to confront people and say, Je, una jua buana. I'm not those guys, eh? <laughs> I'm not one of those guys. Like, do you know Jesus? I'm not those guys. Uh, I'm just not those guys. But for me, I found something that I find usually works for me. Is when I just come and say, I, I usually tell people, by the way, I'm from a church next door uh, called Mavuno. And we're doing a class. Uh, and we're, I'm, I'm doing a practical right now. It's on prayer. And uh, just to test the efficacy of prayer. <laughs> okay, I know it's a lie, but Jesus forgives usually. And I'm like, and so... As part of my practicals, I'd just like to know if there's anything in your life that you need prayer for, because I'd like to pray for you, and let's see if God answers. And usually people are like, okay. So I just say, anything in your business, your marriage, anything. And people are usually like, okay, yeah, me and my wife, yeah, nee, 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 pray, pray, pray. Because most people don't turn away prayer. And then usually I'll be like, can I pray for you right now? Because I want to actually see if this, yeah, okay, let's pray. And then I pray for them some bold prayers. I pray for them everything that they say, even the ones they didn't say. I'm like, Jesus, I just pray for these guys. I don't know where their marriage is right now. I don't know how they're doing, but I'm praying that they'd have an amazing marriage. I'm praying that their children will be so blessed. They live and look at them and wonder where they've come from. Like, I pray a loving prayer. And I pray a prayer where even them, they're like, hey, Kwani, this guy, why is he praying for us such nice prayers? <laughs> Usually by the time I'm finished praying, they're like, they're very warm. They're like, wow, thank you. That was amazing. And I'm like, by the way, do you guys go to church? And they're like, mm, no, no. well, actually, we come from Abuno. I, I, we come to this church. I'd love to invite you. In fact, is any of you a, a believer? Uh, has any of you asked Christ into your life? By the way, it's so simple. And when you do, your marriage changes. That's what I've found. Would you like me to pray for you to come to know Jesus? And sometimes people would say, yes. And you're like, what? Really? <laughs> it, once, it still catches me by surprise. Huh? They're like, yes. You're like, eh? okay, let me just explain again. Huh? Maybe I rushed too fast. Would you like? And they say yes. And you lead them in prayer. And that day when we went, I just explained this to the guys. We all went in twos. And we just stopped people. Can we pray for you? We met college students. We met people who are running shops. We met people in liquor stores. And we just prayed. And that day, I think, was it like, no, it was something like 15, 16 people came to Christ that afternoon. Yeah. Yes. Wow. 
Isn't that amazing? Like 15 people were lost without Jesus. And just because we happened to be in the area, they got to know Jesus. One person had a dramatic story. They met somebody and the person said, I've been looking for someone to lead me to Christ. Like even before they went into the whole story at T, how can we pray for you? The guy was like, I'm just, forget prayer, just lead me to Jesus. Like God already has gone ahead of you. And that, my friends, it's the best feeling. The feeling that I've just changed someone eternity, that this person, their children will be different. Their spouse will be different. Their eternal destiny will be different just because I was there to pray for them. Let me tell you guys, heaven throws a party when one person comes to Jesus. Today there were four parties. Like, like just in this house today, there have been four parties. It, that's ex it's the most, most important thing you can ever do with your life. In fact, the saddest thing is that you can live your whole life and never lead someone to Christ. That's sad. Because that's why you are left here on earth, to bring people to God. So, so this evangelism thing, it's becoming a very important thing uh, for us. Uh, and, and I believe that God wants us to grow. Now, it's interesting because uh, Jesus says... Um, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19, he talks about the Holy Spirit being on him. And then he says, this is the evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in me. And you would expect him to say very interesting things. I mean, how do you know somebody has the Holy Spirit of God working in him? He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That's the evidence that Jesus is on you, that his Spirit is there, that you proclaim, you want to talk to people about him. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus was saying, yes, I know when you think of people being filled with the Spirit, you think of people talking in tongues, you think of people falling on the floor, you speak of, you think of people uh, uh, being, uh, healing people, all those. He said, it's not that those things are bad. But Jesus says, if you want to know the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, this is what happens. You speak the Word of God. You bring freedom to people who are blind. People who are blind and didn't know where they were going, now they can see it. They are changed. I can tell you people in this church who today are spiritual leaders. I mean, their family, they lead their families well. They have amazing children. And I can still remember the day I brought them to Christ. Like, you guy, they would be in a bar somewhere right now, squandering their salary, waiting for the end of the month. Their wife despairing in a prayer group somewhere to pray for her husband. But because that man came and I met him and I led him to Jesus... He's in a different space. Let me tell you, there's nothing, like when I go to heaven, by the way, those are the things I'll be looking, those are, those are the, that's my welcoming committee. That's your crown. Paul says, that's my crown. The stones in my crown will actually be the people that I brought to Christ. And hey, what are you working for on this earth if not to invest in eternity? And so evangelism is something that we're challenging all our churches to consider. Not to consider, to do. We're instructing our churches. Let me change the language. Now, I love what many of our churches are doing. Since we started opening our eyes, God has started giving us opportunity. You know, when you, have, when you want it, it comes. And I know that Lifeway, you guys are running a Saturday outreach. They started going out in their neighborhoods, just sharing the gospel. They found some young people in a playing field somewhere. And so they were like, okay, uh, let's do what we know how to do, because these guys, they know how to do the dance. So they called Hypsess, and they got a small speaker, and they put it up, and they just start the music, and all the kids just come. And then they start, you know how he says, and you know how he does it, huh? He does his thing, the kids all dance all, with all these guys, and then they share the word with them. And now it's become a service. People are coming to Christ. Lifeway is one of the churches that has many people coming to Jesus, by the way. Uh, and we thank God. It's just because they're taking advantage of the situation and the gifts and the things they have around them. And now Saturday is a day of evangelism for these guys. Every Saturday evening they go and they welcome people to church. And people are coming. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Pastor James goes out on Tuesday. They, they go out to, to, they still go out here and they bring people to Christ and they have dramatic stories. Uh, Pastor James, some of his disciples who must be here are people who he met selling alcohol out here and running uh, shops here. And now they are believers. And now they are associates even in this church. And God is just using them. They are growing in their faith. And you know, you see them and you're like, if a pastor, if this guy was not walking around, and just decided to be bold and overcome his natural fear and just speak to them about Jesus, they wouldn't be where they are. And that's, that's the beauty. That's what we want to see. Now imagine if your whole family could know Jesus. You know all those things we're talking about, the spirit of division, the spirit of isolation, all those things dealt with in Jesus' name because your whole family are loving Jesus and growing. Imagine that that is what God's plan is for your family. Yeah, that's it. God wants that for your family. It's a beautiful thing. 
I can tell you, we're, we're doing Simama with my siblings. And the biggest joy I have is we're not trying to convince any of them to get saved. They love Jesus. In fact, my only prayer for them now, like I said, is I'm praying, my brother is here, I'm praying for them to become pastors. Because it's like salvation we passed a long time ago. Now it's like, Lord, I just want them to be leaders in the kingdom of God. Because they have it. They're, 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 they're going to have a, None of them can live a life of mediocrity. They're my siblings. And it's a beautiful thing when we go home and our parents are not saying, oh, pray for your brother. He's out there drinking, chasing what? Pray for your sister. She's... It's, my parents don't have those problems. It's a beautiful thing. Amen. Yeah. Guess what? You're the solution for your family. Amen. Guess what? Your family will all know Jesus. Amen. Guess what? Next year, we'll all have testimonies of people who got saved in our families in this church in Jesus' name. So I want to say this. We're entering into a space, as your pastors are calling you into a space of evangelism and challenging you, one of the things I want to challenge is our discipleship groups to take this challenge. And that in every discipleship group, at least one person would come to Christ every week. Every week, your discipleship group would lead one person. Now, that's, if you're five or six of you, that means, like five or six of you, one a week, that means a whole, you lead a person to Christ personally every six weeks. Then you can recover it for the next six weeks. <laughs> or you build the next relationship, whatever it is. But guess what? We're not even talking about, it, it's, it's going to be in the office. It's going to be in the home. Some of you, it's going to be the people who work for you, the security guard in your house. Some of you, it's going to be uh, the children's home next door. Yeah. God is just going to give you opportunities, but you have to align your heart yeah. to desire to see that transformation. Yeah. I told you about those kids who are leading thousands of people to Christ every week because they all of a sudden understood this is what we're here for. Now, we were just talking with Pastor Ndachi earlier, and he was telling me he's been doing a series, and he realized that the agenda of the secular humanists in this country is serious. The agenda to spread the LGBTQ doctrine is serious. And they're no longer bothering to reach you because they know your hearts are made up. They're going straight for your kids. That's where they're going. And they're talking to your children in the high schools, uh, sorry, in the primary schools, through the cartoons, through the things that you're exposing them through on that phone. They're reaching, they're, they have an evangelistic <laughs> agenda for your children. Listen, these kids will not be saved by us sitting at home and singing Father Abraham. We are going to have to become evangelists ourselves. Nobody will save your children unless you yourself are invested. I remember leading our children to Christ when they were young with my wife and then discipling them as they grew up. It's going to have to be at that level. I, I, I figured Mavuno Kids has many kids. They might miss one of mine. Me, I can't miss. They're all mine. <laughs> so I'm like, let them do what they're doing. But for me and my house, I'm going to have to bring up these kids to know Jesus. And God is going to give you opportunities to bring many people to him. I really believe in this season, if we step out in this way, my goodness, already since we started, by the way, I think it was a very random thing. We were hardly bringing people to Christ. But since we started this about four or five weeks ago, every week, uh, I'm going to ask Pastor Kilonzi, he even knows, how many people have given their life to Christ this week at Mavuno Church, Pastor Kilonzi? Do you know? So, um, this month, it's 148. This month, 148 people have given their lives to Jesus in November. <laughs> Amen. Since August, 843 people have come to Christ in Mavuno Church. We're not talking theories here. We're talking about amazing things that are happening. This young lady called Judy, uh, led some, you guys led some people to Christ. I know your stories because your pastors gossip about you. And there's a great story about how you guys were shopping. Just tell us that story. I think it's just a very interesting story. I love that story. Hi. Uh, my sister Rose, who is here. Um, and myself went to Toy, which by the way is a Mtumba market. Uh, Sec on second hand clothing market. Okay. I'm saying that for the benefit of our international <laughs> audience. Yeah, so um, at Gone, we wanted to buy shoes. So we went to a couple of stalls and we had just, you know, been challenged by our father, Pastor Jemo, <laughs> <laughs> to recognize opportunities for evangelism. I have to say that um, I was very scared of evangelism, believe it or not, the preacher that I am. And the first day that Pastor Jemo told me to accompany him to do evangelism at uh, Great War, I was terrified. And I, I watched him do it, and I thought, and as God would have it, a lady gave her life to Christ on that day, and I was floored. I couldn't believe that in 2021, you can walk up to a stranger and bring them to Christ. Because you had really complicated. We complicated, yeah. Yeah. So I, I became a convert immediately. So I think it was the next weekend, and my sister and I went to Toy Market. And 
in every stall where we went, we shared our faith. And that day we led five men to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like, like you go shopping and it's dangerous. Like you're dangerous. Isn't that a crazy story? I love that story. It's like there are opportunities every day, everywhere. I remember when we were in the place I was telling you in Uganda, we were laughing this afternoon about a story. There's this little girl who's 15. I mean, she is tiny. I mean, I felt my heart warmed up to her because she's like a daughter, you know. And she told us her story about how uh, three men, she was walking and three guys cut cold. <laughs> you know that kind of thing guys do. And so she just said, eh, okay. She walked up to them. What do you guys want? <laughs> like, first of all, as a father, I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> so she told them, do you guys realize, when they started now hemming and hawing, she said, do you realize I could have HIV? How would that work for your future? Do you understand that your purpose is much bigger? that you could just be destroying yourselves right now. Do you know that God created you for much more than this? That he actually created you to know him and have an impact in life. And she says, I want to, and she said, she shared with them and then said, I'd like to lead you to Christ. Two of the three boys became Christians. She told them, I'm going to church for a church meeting, follow me. They followed her to church. She presented them to the pastor. They became part of her discipleship group. She discipled them. Now they are discipling other people. What? As in dangerous people, don't cut call a girl from Mavuno Church. If you know what's good for your eternity. Hey, like she's just a sniper. <laughs> like I was just like, what? Like the devil will be telling guys, shut up, shut up, those are Mavunites. Don't, don't cut call those ones. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> this, this, is, this is how the world needs to change people. One person at a time. And so I want to really, I, I, every week we're now, now we keep track. Because one of the things we became convinced is in the book of Acts, that it's all about numbers. 5,000 were added. 3,000 were added. Many people were added. So now we track our numbers every week. And the reason we track it is that we can also pray and challenge ourselves to reach people. So I want to challenge you to join your pastors because your pastors are doing it. And as you lead people to Christ, let them know so they can actually count those people because, of, because we want to reach out to those people and to help them grow in their faith, which is a third, which is a third rhythm. Amen. Amen. So prayer, evangelism. Number three is visitation. Visitation. Now, it's interesting because visitation just basically means that you keep track of those you give birth to. You look after the babies. Like I said before, when you bring people to Christ and then you just leave them, or when you take people through Mizizi and and just leave them, then basically what happens, they become vulnerable. And you've just created orphans. So visitation means that once I bring you to Christ, once I connect with you, once I have a contact with you, that I actually go to where you are. I love the fact that Jesus proves this for us. That he meets the disciples. Uh, he's going around and, the, and one of them is told there is the, 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 the savior of the world, the, uh, the, son, of my, the son of God. And, and the guy says, eh, that's Andrew. And the next thing he's like, Jesus, where do you live? And they follow him to the house. And then he goes and tells his brother, Peter, hey, we found Jesus. And they hung out with Jesus. Guess what Jesus does next? He goes to their office. I love that. Do you ever get that? He actually goes to their office because their office is a boat. They're fishermen. And Jesus goes to their boat. He hangs out in their office and he prays for their business to prosper. That's what visitation is. He goes and he prays. And guess what happens? They've caught nothing the whole night. And then he tells them, God gives him a divine idea. He's like, so you cast over there. Now, it's, it's you going into some architect's office and saying, so you draw the line like this. And the guy is like, what do you know? You've not been to architect school. <laughs> then he draws and he's like, oh my God, that's exactly, that's exactly what happens to the disciples, isn't it? Yeah. They cast where he says, and the next thing is the boat is falling. They've never caught so many fish. They fall on their knees and they're like, okay, tell us what to do. He says, follow me and I'll make you. Isn't that powerful? So visitation is going to where people are. It means that you're actually intentionally looking for opportunities to visit people. When you have visitors in your campus, uh, people come to visit your church, there should be people who visit them immediately. The next week, they should have an office visit. Somebody should actually go see them at work, go see them at home. This is taking us out of our comfort zone. It completely does, because who does that? But let me tell you, when someone does that, the kind of doors it opens are phenomenal. People are just impressed that you would actually come and visit them in the office and pray for them to prosper. I'll come over lunch and I'll just pray for you. What? That's what visitation is. You get to know the person's life. 
you get to enter into their life. If you're, if you're in a discipleship group and you're leading your discipleship group, don't just wait to meet them on Sunday when they come to church. Visit them. Go to their homes. Eat with them. Jesus went to their homes. He went to Peter's house. And he found the mother-in-law. His, his wife's mother was, was unwell. And he prayed for her and the fever left. No wonder the wife just said, you just follow Jesus. It's okay. Um, you have my permission. You never hear Peter having domains with his wife following Jesus. I think it's because you heal someone's mom, you've touched their heart. It's like, just follow. We'll support you from home. Uh, he goes where it counts. He goes to their house. And so this coming week, uh, oh my gosh, I'm so looking forward to it. So me and my exec team, we're taking a road trip to Western Kenya to visit Pastor Sheila's uh, father-in-law and to visit Pastor Milton's mom. And we're just going together. We're just taking a road trip. I love these guys. I can't wait to just spend a few days visiting one of their families. And we're going to visit. And, and by the way, I, I told my mom-in-law, and she's like, why haven't they come to visit me first? <laughs> so, so you guys have already got an invite to... So by the way, I think it's just... Ministry is so much fun when you love the people, when it's family. So the people you're discipling, don't just make them your mizizi group. Visit them. Let them visit each other. Build family. And I believe as we visit in this way, things begin to shift. When somebody comes to Lifeway or comes to Mashariki for the first time, and that week somebody goes and visits them in the office or in the house, and just says, I'm here to pray for you. I just wanted to come and pray for you. My goodness, it's like it shows something. Because nobody in the world does that. Nobody for, no corporate company does that, by the way. This is a kingdom principle, and it works. It takes, by the way, how many people are like private people here? It's like, I'm a private person. I like being home. This mambo of visiting, even going to visit other people is just a hard thing for me. Yeah, I know. I get it. I get it. Let me tell you, even me, I like being in the house. It's, sometimes I have to really psych myself to get out and go. But let me tell you, the reward when you go is insane. Uh, pastor Sai, she's actually our campus pastor for one of our campus pastors for Mabuno Kampala. <laughs> and, and, and right now, she's, she's visiting us. She's our spiritual daughter, so she's staying at our house, uh, just uh, taking a few weeks with us. But it's interesting, when you first came, I think you're shocked at how many visitors we have. Yes. Like, like, lit like our house. Since, since we decided to go this way, we've just opened our lives to the people that we love and we shepherd. And our house is full of people. By the way, Pastor Carol and I, we don't look like it, but we're very private people. Uh, we like our space. But then we realize that privacy will not help you disciple. It won't. Jesus had no private space. These guys would hang out with him all the time. He just spent time. They spent time with him. And so in a sense, even now when he dies, remember his brothers become part of the disciples. James, the brother of Jesus, becomes one of the leaders of the church. Why? Because he's been so exposed to Jesus' buddies. He, even when Jesus is not there, he's one of them. These guys have just been living together. There's just a connection, life on life. This individual privacy that we've been taught, it's not a good thing for the kingdom of God. You'll have enough privacy in heaven, I hope, uh, when you have your own mansion with many rooms. But for now on earth, there's a reason. Your life is meant to touch people's lives. The, the business of the kingdom is a business of people. And so I want us to really uh, take this one seriously. We need to be good shepherds. Zechariah 11, 15 to 16. Zechariah 11, 15 to 16. It says, the Lord said to me, take again the equipment of a foolish shepherd. He said, I want you to be a foolish shepherd. And then he tells him what a foolish shepherd is. For I'm going to raise up a shepherd over the land who will not care for the lost or seek the young or heal the injured or feed the healthy, but will eat the meat of the choice sheep, tearing off their hooves. Wow. That's a, a spiritual leader who doesn't care about the people. He's just there to get the best from them. You come for my Bible study, you tell me what I want to hear, and then I leave you. I don't care about you. And Jesus says, that's a foolish shepherd. None of us in this house will be foolish shepherds in Jesus' name. That's not our portion. Our homes will actually become... Let me tell you something. Part of the reason my house... My house is blessed. People come to my house and they don't want to leave. It's, it's blessed. There's a spirit that rests on that house. And it's not just my house. Any property that we own is blessed. But part of the reason it's blessed is because we've opened our house to be God's house. We've said anything that we own is God's. So this house that we live in, it's like, God, this house is open for your people. We will host with it. We will use it as a kingdom resource. It's actually not our house. It's your house. You, it's an extension of your kingdom. And guess what happens when you begin to do that? My goodness, the blessings of the Lord flow. Because my house is as good as a church. It's a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. People come to my house who haven't slept in a long time, and they sleep like babies. 
There she is. She can tell you. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Even our guest house, because we own a commercial guest house, Muslims come for a retreat and they sleep there and they ask, what's in this place? There's something different. We slept. It was peaceful. Why? Because it's a sanctuary of the Most High. You know, you can dedicate your house, you can bless it, you can put pictures of Jesus in it, but it's your house. That's not a blessing. But when you open your house and say, Lord, this is actually an extension of, for your church. <laughs> this is actually a part of your place. This is, you can use it. Bring people. I love Nyamo and, 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 and your hubby Joe. I mean, it's like you are drunk and you don't have food. Come home, we feed you. What? Most people will be like, just stay there. I'll send the maid in an hour to bring you food if you're here. It's like, come to my house. Their house is Jesus' house. No wonder miracles are happening in their house. It's happening. So if you want to see miracles, open up. That car that God gave you wasn't for you to look good in. It was for you to do ministry with. That's how it is. So my car, it's an extension of the kingdom. I do ministry with my car. My, every possession of mine, by the way, belongs to the kingdom. And guess what happens? When it becomes God's, even the insurance is covered by God. God looks after my things. I'm not afraid. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you guys a secret in case you, some, there's a car thief watching this. I never lock my car. I don't. Why? Because it's guarded by the Holy Spirit. And it's His. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, Lord, just look after it. My house. The only reason I lock it is because I'm married. And my wife, my wife would shoot me if I leave the doors open. When I'm alone, even in hotel rooms, may I just leave the door open? I'm like, oh yeah, sour, come. There will be fire on you, by the way. <laughs> Serious fire. Because the angels are God. Why? Because it's not mine. It's a Holy Spirit. I remember even telling, I, I, in fact, it's so strange. <laughs> my wife even tells me, this is dangerous about me. When, when, when we have people who work for us, I warn them. I say, by the way, there are people who've stolen my stuff, and it has not gone well for them. So I, I, I don't lock things. My room is open. You can enter. But just know that it will not go well for you. And I'm not, seriously, it's a crazy thing. I, actually, I, st I tell them that out of concern. I've actually had someone vomit blood in my house for no reason. And the Holy Spirit revealed it's because of things touched that they shouldn't have touched. So it's, 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 I know this sounds spooky. It sounds weird. But it is biblical. It is God's things. My things are dedicated things. In the Bible, when you touch a dedicated thing, you die. When you use it for the reason it's not meant to be. But guess why it's a dedicated thing? It's because it's not mine. It's God's. And that means if something happens to it, I don't mourn. Some people mourn a car when it has been crushed as if it's a person who has died. It's just a car. The Holy Spirit who provided will provide another one. It's a house. By the way, that's, that's how I live. I live like this. And by the way, when you do that, then your, your, your home becomes a place where people find refuge. It becomes a place where the women who are in church, who are battered, will come and they will find solace. Uh, people who are looking for a place just to be like the youth of your church, they'll come. You'll tell the youth pastor, by the way, when you have a party and you just want to host, use my house. It's available. Uh, it's there. I trust God that a time is coming when Mavuno will just have multiple houses to do ministry in. Because people are like, pastor, our house is available. And guess what happens? Some of you will be praying, Lord, I need a bigger house. Not because, at my house, because of my pride. Because there are so many disciples in the church. I need a place for them. The Lord blesses you, by the way, when you're asking for things. When you pray according to His will. You know, Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. But you know what I used to think? I used to think that means I just do what God wants so that He can do what I want. That's not what it means. Guess what happens? When you delight yourself in the Lord, it means you surrender to the Lord, you give Him your all, your desires begin to change. You start desiring the things God desires. And you know, even in the corporate world, when you align with your boss's vision, you get promoted. Corporate people in the house, is that true? When you align with the boss's vision, you get promoted. So when you start aligning with God's desires, guess what happens? Boom. Anything you ask for, it comes to you. And that's what God wants us to do in this season. So visitation. I want to just challenge us that all discipleship group leaders, visit your people at least once every season. Anybody in your, if you have a discipleship group of six, make sure you visit their homes at least once every season. And if possible, go together. 
If not, you can even go alone. But know your people. Don't, don't see them as units of production. See them as people. Visit them. Jesus visited Peter in his house. Visit people. Let's get out of our shell. Let's get out of that space. Let's get into the space of visitation. When something happens and you go to a funeral meeting uh, in a family of somebody in your discipleship group, don't go there shyly and sit in the back. No. You're a pastor of Mavuno Church. You're a representative of the kingdom. I, I've never forgotten. I was so proud. Once we went for a very uh, a funeral in a, past, in a prominent person. This guy was a former minister. Very big house. And a Mavunite had passed on he, and, and were connected with Hill City. And that day, I remember I was, I was there, and they said, all, Mavuno, all pastors come to the front. And I saw a team, Kina Judy, and many other associates in this church. I just saw them coming. In fact, these guys were like, which church is this? It's like we're, all of us, all the guys in that life group were like, we are pastors. Come on, we're here. <laughs> I was so proud of this church. I was like, yes, they know who they are. They walk with authority. That's who Mavunites are. So when you go to that funeral meeting, stand up and say, on behalf of Mavuno Church. And on behalf of Pastor Moridi and the executive team of Mavuno Church, we are here to offer condolences. And when you're done, they shouldn't be looking for a pastor to come. They're like, the pastors came. And by the way, I'm not telling you this as fiction. There are many groups in Mavuno Church that have made me proud like that. I remember going to some, some funeral meetings, and I reached, and I talked, and they said, oh, but the pastors were already here. And it was a life group, by the way. They didn't even know that these guys are not paid pastors. And they were not even waiting for me to show up because they felt the pastors were there. And guess what happens? The, the loyalty it wins of your, the people around you is amazing. Because if you want loyal followers, you have to be a loyal leader. So, so let's be in the habit of visitation. Visitation. The next one is teaching. And I've got just two more. And then I'll be done with this one. Teaching. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. The first thing these people devoted themselves to was their apostles' teaching. This, for me, is an amazing thing I've come to understand. We need to be devoted to the preaching of God's word from the family pulpit. Devoted means that they were committed. They were passionate about. They leaned into. They became excited about it. That's what it was. That this was not just a word, it was God's word for them. And they went to church with that idea of, my goodness, God is going to speak to me today. Like, I better, I better be ready. And they had their notebook out. Any problems I have, I come for solution. I come to the house of God expecting solutions. And they leaned forward. They wow. devoted themselves. Now, I believe in this season, God is going to do some powerful things through teaching. As, by the way, the guys have been Mavuno for many years. You can tell, this is the first time we've ever done this. Like, I've never talked this long at Mavuno. <laughs> yeah? I haven't. But it's because I've come to be the conclusion that when the church is not taught, the church withers. And teaching in God's word is what is going to nourish your spirits. Right now, I can already tell you that you're going to be different after today. Just this one day is going to change us. Our homes are going to be different just because we did this, by the way. You gave up your Saturday. You could have been doing something. You could have been playing golf. You could have been sleeping. You could have been running at Karura. <laughs> But you are here. And I want to tell you, because of the teaching of God's word, you will not be the same. You will not be the same. The Bible tells us that the apostle Paul, he taught in the hall of Tyrannus, and he taught God's people for two months every day. Every day. Isn't that crazy? Like every single day, he taught in the hall of Tyrannus. I mean, he taught, for, he, he taught incredibly. But the Bible tells us, and let me see if I can find that passage, because it was such a powerful passage. Acts chapter 19, verse 8 to 12. And it says, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. The people who had been Jews, the religious people, they became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years. Can you imagine a guy preaching daily for two years? Like, what a service that was. Two years of God's word. Just teaching precept after precept. I can't even believe, like, I'm like, I wish I was there. Like, what wisdom this guy passed on. What spiritual revelation he passed on. To, no wonder the gospel spread. 
And he says, um, this went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia had the word of the Lord. So in other words, he would teach people, they would go and teach others. And after two years, everybody in the, in the province had had the word of the Lord. There's a power when teaching happens. Uh, this, this is something that I believe, that when we devote ourselves, when we are consistent with God's teaching, then something begins to happen. Let me tell you this. In every church, there are people who listen to the same message, and it tells us, the Bible tells us, 25% in a typical church receive the word and are blessed, and it bears fruit in their life. This is Jesus' own words. You know that, huh? 25%. He says in the parable of the sower, a quarter of, the, of one, some of the seed, a quarter of the seed, there, there are four types of soil. And he says some of it falls on fertile ground and bears fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. That's powerful. That's powerful. You know, when we, when we went with uh, Pastor Kilonzi to Uganda and we listened to that pastor, we said, Lord, may we have even just 30-fold. We don't even need 100-fold. <laughs> just 30-fold of what this guy is pouring right now. Our church will never be the same. 25%. The Bible says the other 25%, guess what happens? They have hard ground, so the seed falls, and it, just, it doesn't even take root. Those are the guys whose hearts are just lost. They came into church with an, an offended spirit. They came into church with, with no intention of listening. They came into church with another agenda. And so it was lost even before it was preached. The pastor was wasting his time with them. There's another group where it falls, it takes uh, root, but then the Bible tells us, actually it falls, and then the birds come and take it away. And those are the ones who come, they receive the word, they're excited about it, they leave the church, and the devil just comes and brings them my issues. And it's just stolen away from them. Spiritual issues just steal away the word from them. And then there's that other percentage of people who come and the word takes root and it starts doing well, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth, the, the weeds come up and choke it. And so the business, the hustles, all that stuff just choke it. And then he says there's 25%. 25%. There's that group of people who bear fruit. Ask your neighbor, are you here to bear fruit? Yeah, this is it. We're here to bear fruit. We want to be those fruitful people. And when we bear, we bear fruit by doing the word, listening to the word. And let me tell you something, a little secret. I talked about this earlier. The more you listen to many messages, the less you do anything about them. The more churches you're listening to, the less likelihood that you will be one of that 25%. I've been there, by the way. I've had podcasts from Pastor This, Pastor Who, Pastor What, and just filled my whole playlist. And every day, just powering my mind with different thoughts. And let me tell you what happens. They just immunize my, word from, my heart from God's word. And that's why I challenged you earlier. If you would just take the word from, from Mavuno Downtown, just take the word that Pastor Kilonzi preached. Make that your word this week. Soak over that word. Meditate. Meditate means that you regurgitate it. You know how cows, they chew cud. You take that, the cow eats, and then it stores the word. That's you taking notes. Then it takes, it's a bit disgusting, but it's, it's life. It pushes it back up, and you just see a cow, it hasn't even eaten anything. You just see, <laughs> what's that thing eating? It's eating the stuff it ate before, but now it's brought it up, so it can meditate on it. It can chew it, it can masticate, it can put saliva and enzymes, and the thing is being broken down, becoming nutritious. So that's you now afterwards on Tuesday. Now you've taken the word, you've listened to it. And you're like, my gosh, I missed that point. That is so powerful. Oh, wow, I love that. And then now the next day again, now you remove it again. And this time it's in your quiet time and you're asking yourself, God, what is the thing you're telling me? What is this? Am I doing what I was told? Guess what's happening as you're doing that? The word is entering into you. Obedience is becoming a part of your lifestyle. And let me tell you when I've done that, a couple of things changed for me. When I started doing that with my pastor, Bishop Oscar, <laughs> First of all, I started loving the man. Wow. Like, I, I just started admiring him. I'd taken him for granted for many years. You know how we are as Kenyans, eh? We take, and, and, and maybe it's a human thing, we take good leaders for granted. We wait until a bad leader does something, and you're like, I knew it. <laughs> but as long as someone is doing a good thing, you're like, that's his job. So that's how I was. But when I started listening honestly and meditating on what this guy was saying, I started realizing, my goodness, he's so, there's an anointing this guy has. There's a power he has. There's a prophetic ability that God has given him. And I began to want to tap into that anointing. I began to pray for his anointing. I began to pray for the authority that he has. My wife can tell you, for many years I prayed that God would give me the same authority that Bishop Oscar has. I'd see him standing in front of a crowd. I'm like, God, I want to be like that man. I just need what he has. There's a power you've given him. Well, guess what? I really believe that God gave it to me. I'm not... 
I'm not him for sure because I'm Moravi. But God has allowed me to speak in places that I saw him speaking in. And I said, how is an African speaking in that space? Well, I've also spoken in that place. Are you understanding what I'm saying? But a lot of that came out of just understanding the anointing that the man had. When you don't understand the anointing your pastor has, you just see them as a man of God. You just see them as an employee of the church. When you understand this is your spiritual father who has a word for you, then you receive the blessing of receiving him. So I really believe that in this season we must teach and we must receive. All of us must become expert receivers. Amen. Expert receivers. An expert receiver in the house. Yes, we must become expert receivers. Receiving that word like nobody else. Let me tell you, sit up in church. Sit in the front. Be in the hallelujah row. Yeah, be in the hallelujah bench. Be one of those guys. And let me tell you, there's something crazy that happens. They look foolish, but guess what happens? Because of their hallelujah, they're listening more. That's a crazy thing. When you, when you get excited and you get engaged, you actually pick more. Because you don't have time to get distracted, to think what's for lunch, to look at your phone, what time is it. You know, all that goes away because you're engaging, you're leaning forward. And guess what? You can come to church together, but you find some people just receiving. That 25%, they live with the word. Be that 25%. Hallelujah, bench. In Jesus' name. That's you. In your church. In your church. When I come to visit your campus, I want you on Hallelujah, bench, if you're in this room. That's you. Be in that space. Receive. And then become expert teachers. That means when you listen to family night, because I want every one of you, this is our ritual. And let me just say this. That's one of the rituals of the family. Uh, one, of the, one of the rhythms is family night. Uh, it's a place of teaching for us. Uh, you need to be in family night. There's no excuse. You have to be there. It's every Wednesday, 5.30 to 6.30. If you miss it, it's on YouTube. You can always catch it, but don't miss it. And if you miss it, catch it as quickly as possible. And if you can't listen to it again after you've heard it. And guess what? Once you've heard it, the best test, the best way to internalize it, teach it to someone else. Let me tell you, if you ever want to become good at something, teach it. Because first of all, if you know you're going to teach what I'm saying, right now, if I'm, what I'm telling you, you're going to teach. Guess what you'd be doing? You would be taking significant notes because it's like my disciples need to know this stuff. This is life-changing stuff. You'd be leaning forward. And that's what happens is that as you teach it, you own it. My wife and I, the reason we teach couples, we do couples ministry, is because our marriage needs help. Like long ago, we determined, hey, we really need help. So we thought the best way we can get help is just be around couples with issues. First of all, it helps us regurgitate how we learned, what we learned, so that we are reminded. Secondly, sometimes, of course, you look at them and you're like, okay, we thought we had issues, ours are not so bad. Uh, thirdly, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. So, so anyway, what I'm trying to say is, when you teach, it becomes you then our facilitators in this house can testify. Yeah, you're, every time you facilitate, it's more for you than for the, the other people. You are, your marriage ends up being even more strengthened than theirs. So, so teach it as you receive it. And let me tell you, if every week you could commit yourself, the thing I'm going to learn from my pastor this week, I will teach it. Just commit yourself to do that. You will see significant spiritual growth in your life. I'm, take, I'm giving you this as something to test, test me on. Just try it for the next month. Every week, whatever you receive at Mavuno, teach it to at least one person. And then come and testify and tell me what has happened in your life. Because I suspect you're going to see some miracles that you've not even experienced. Even just being able to say, by the way, I learned this in church. I just wanted to share it with you because it's been such a powerful truth for me. I just thought, I want to hear what you think about it. Our pastor was saying this, this, this. What do you think? Just try. You'll be shocked. Or teach it to your kids in your family devotion time. And just report to me because I suspect you're going to see God do some significant things. So this is the teaching part, and I think we need to de devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Now I'm going to finish, uh, then we can have a tea break, um, because the last part, in the, in the last session, I'm, go I'm going to talk about something I think that is really important, and that is, what then must we do to be saved? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just going to give a few tips, and I'm, that one's going to be a short session. But the last rhythm I want to talk about is healing before we take our team, number, number five, um, healing. I talked about Paul in the synagogue, and then he was kicked out, and he went to the hall of Tyrannus in Acts chapter 19. And then he taught for two years, and he taught every day. That's till verse 10. Verse 11 says something extraordinary happened. It said, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. After teaching for two years, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, 
So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. What? In other words, when you apply yourself to teaching, and Paul applied himself to teaching, miracles happen that even, even Jesus never did that. Like, have you ever heard of Jesus? First of all, I don't know if he had a handkerchief. <laughs> but even if he did, we've never heard of his handkerchief healing anyone. Like Paul, just through this teaching, the anointing increased so much in the church that people would just be like, let me bring a handkerchief, touch you. They go home, touch the sick guy, step up. And the girl would step up. Like he didn't even have to do miracles. The people in the church were doing the miracles. They just take the anointing and go home with it. That's, by the way, there's no other place in the scripture that has that level of anointing. The, tell me another passage where you see a church on fire like that. It's insane. It came out of that regular teaching of God's word. So I'm going to challenge you guys. We're going to do teaching. Right now, our listening muscles are developing. Today, I've stretched you a bit. Uh, it's, it, we've never sat as Mavuno and learned for a whole day. Uh, I've stretched you. But a time is coming when we'll be doing four days of teaching. It's coming. And I can, I can promise you that in that season, the miracles you will see, you've never seen. And those miracles will happen even here among us before they go out to the church. So that's the season we're entering into. But Paul, is just by that one, that, that season of teaching the miracles began to happen. I really believe that our ministry must be marked by signs and wonders. It must be. We must trust God to do things that nothing in the world can do. We must trust God to give us evidence. If you want to reach people in the world who don't like church, then we must trust God that through our prayer, their lives will be so changed that it will not be our con it's, it's not our arguments that will convince people to follow Jesus. I mean, this, this guy that you guys prayed for, I mean, he got saved, but it was like a saved of, okay, since you insist. I suspect after that healing, that dude, he's right now, he's like, that's it. I'm a following this Jesus of yours. There's something that, miracles, by the way, are not even for believers. If you look at the scripture, miracles are actually for people as a sign so that they believe. For us, we're going to heaven anyway. This body is just a tent. If it has issues, yes, they can be healed. But like Paul, Jesus may decide not to heal them. That's okay. Because a heavenly body is coming that will have no issues. So I can even bear with it because I'm only here for a temporary time. But there need to be miracles for those who don't know Jesus to know him so they can come to church. And I'm trusting God that every one of you, you will have the ability to lay hands on people and they will be healed. That's the season we're in. And let me give you, tell you how to start. Just begin like those children. I loved the faith of those children. By the way, here's the thing I learned from them. They would go, they pray. They don't pray dramatically like, Lord, heal him now. <laughs> They just pray, Lord Jesus, you're here. We trust you. Heal this person. And Lord, when I come back next week, I expect to see some change. And then they'd say, I'm coming next week. And when they come and they see a bit of change, they don't say, oh, you didn't heal him completely. They're like, oh, praise God for that change. Now let's pray for more change. And the Lord would answer their faith. And I believe that this is how we must be the faith of little children. When I ask my father, he will do it. He will do it because he's my father. He won't do it for you, but he'll do it for me. <laughs> You know, when I ask him. And so just going with my, to my father with that faith on behalf of others. And I believe that in this season, God wants us to enter into that space where there are results of our faith. So I'm going to challenge you in every church. Let's pray for miracles. Let's make that a habit. Let's pray for healing. Let's pray for reconciliation. Let's trust God for things. We, we've said a woman in crutches walked. Yeah, we've seen a man with a swollen knee that was healed in front of their eyes. She said it was weird. A swollen knee reducing in front of their eyes. That's weird. Let's trust God for miracles in this church, people. And every time I go for evangelism, I pray for miracles. I pray. And I'm just like, Lord, in fact, by the way, let me tell you, when you're praying for a non-Christian, you pray for miracles like you never prayed before. Because I'm like, Lord, this guy needs to believe. If you don't answer this prayer, he will not believe. So Lord, in Jesus' name, you have no choice. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying aloud. But inside, I'm like, Lord, you had better vindicate this word I've preached on your behalf. Heal this person. And as I pray for healing and it happens, my goodness, all glory goes to God. So I believe that these signs and wonders are what are going to win this city for Jesus, are going to win this world for Jesus. And I want to encourage us. This one is going to be a new one. It's not one we've walked in and we've practiced. But I really believe that every single one of us, we must take those steps of faith. Let's start praying. At home, when a child gets sick, we normally not, we get our children around them and we all lay hands ever since they were young. And we pray and trust God for a miracle. Because we want our children to understand the laying on of hands. There's power in the laying on of hands. We want to teach our children that. 
And we've seen miracles in our fa um, family as we prayed for each other. I believe, by the way, when there's a concerted prayer, in my extended family, we started praying for each other as we were doing Simama. And my brother can testify and my sister who are here that we've seen miracles in that season that are just remarkable. Every time we agree in a, as a family in prayer, even just this week, last week, we made some prayer requests. By the time somebody was saying, can you post the prayer requests? They were posted, it's like, ah, that one was already answered. Two days later, this one has already been answered. Oh, this interview came through. Oh, this, it's like they had all happened. Why? Because there's a unity when we pray and we can trust God for miracles. And that's why, by the way, all the things we talked about, the family unity is so important because when there's unity, God commands a blessing. And so this is something that we're trusting God for. So these are our rhythms, people. You're going to see us getting into these rhythms. We're going to be challenging you about these rhythms. It's going to be part of our language. These are some of the things we're going to count in this season because you count what you value. We want to see people praying. Every, year, every, every day, the, campus, the, the network leaders, they report to me how many people are praying. I don't ask them because of just a number. Because for me, what it's telling me is how many people in your campus have hearts that are being transformed by God through discipleship. That's all I want to know. So when I see 70 or 80 in downtown, I'm like, there's something God is doing in that place. There's something God is doing. So that's, that's we, we ask that. We, we record the number of people getting saved. You could tell he knew it right there. We actually count every week. We want to know. We count how many people we're visiting. We're making it a habit now. We want to be a church that visits and that goes to where people are. I want, if you're leading a ministry team, you need to know where they live. Your house needs to be a place that's open. In fact, one of the things we're trusting God is that many people will open. Some of you have nice houses that you can open up and actually your neighbors won't come to church, but you can actually start having church in your house. And it becomes an extension of downtown. Downtown Annex. Lifeway Annex, you know? And people come to your house and they watch the service and after that, the pastor does the altar call and then you take the offering. <laughs> yeah, why not? I believe this is part of how we grow the church in this season. Uh, if there's another lockdown, what do we do? We can't just stay outside the church. Uh, so we have to learn how to be the church wherever we go. So these are some of the habits and the, the things that we're trusting God for. And along with all that is generosity. I think that's, that's one I just want to put in as an extra generosity. Because the Bible says all the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Nobody had luck in that church. Nobody had luck in that church. God's people, I feel like in this season, God wants us to be a generous church. It means that we become generous to the people in our discipleship groups. The Bible says you can't tell somebody, God bless you, be at peace, and the person is struggling. The person doesn't have a job. So we become their job and <laughs> employment agency as a, as a discipleship group for everybody in that group. We use our networks for one another. We practice generosity. I believe I taught earlier this year about tithing. And I talked about the fact that when you tithe, it opens the floodgates of heaven. It attracts God's blessings. That's a promise of Scripture. I want to just trust that there's, not sing there's no single person in this house who will invite the devourer into their house this year. That tithing will not become an issue for us. We'll be those people who tithe without thinking. But we also trust in God that we'll grow beyond that. I remember one, one day I had a story about a man called, uh, one of those guys I was following, Rick, Pastor Rick Warren. And he trusted God. He told God, I want to tithe 10% like everybody else, but I want to grow that to the place where I'm tithing 90% and living on 10%. Yeah. And I remember just being so struck and saying, God, I want that. I want that. So I began to pray that for our lives, for Kara. And Kara knows. In fact, I, I started incrementally. Every year, we added 1%. We, and we, got, we learned this when we got married. So year one, it was 11. Year two, 12. Year three, 13, 14. So now we should be at 37%. That's what we should be at. But at some point, God just showed me something called a divine economy. When you're, no, when you're no longer tied to money, God shows you how to think kingdom about money. And guess what has happened? I give my whole salary to Mavuno. I give 100%. I don't even give 90%. I give 100%. Every month, 100% of my income goes to Mavuno Church. Every month. Is that, is that crazy? Like, I actually volunteer in this church. I, I, I give and I volunteer. And guess what has happened? God has blessed my family. Last year... COVID year, we built a house for cash. Like we didn't talk to a bank. We just took cash and we built a house with God's divine economy. Amen. Yes, you do. That's your portion in Jesus' name. That's our portion in Jesus' name. That's how we live. God, we, I've just learned to live like that. This year, <laughs> I haven't even told you guys this. We need to have this conversation. I think we've averaged what you guys used to pay me 
I've been earning three times that much every month. Three times. I know. Your Pastor Sheila is wondering where, which which NYS contract, which government contract did you land? Which tender is this that you landed, Pastor M, that you've not told us about? It's very true. But part of it is understanding spiritual realities. I'll give you a story that was shared with me um, by Apostle Moses Bukisa. He's pretty open about it. And we're there with Pastor Kilonzi, so he can testify it's true. When we were building our house, these guys at Worship Harvest, they understand something about the power of generosity. And so when I told Pastor Apostle Mo, I'm building a house, I'm trusting God for it, it's cash, it's going to be, this is last year, remember we're meeting every week. He did something I didn't expect. He just sent a text to his executive team. He told them, guys, houses, houses, houses. He said, the man of God is building a house. We must be part of that house. He said, all of you want houses. I've heard you guys talking about houses. I want you to tap into the anointing. Everybody give you a gift. I will, I will send it to him. So they sent me a gift. They sent me a gift for that house. Guys, you don't even, you don't even say wow yet because you don't know what they sent. But I'll tell you, <laughs> they sent me a million Kenya shillings. I know. Mudon, you're like, not from the church. Not from the church. From their own, the pastors came together. And they gave. And, each, and they gave me a... I was in shock. That's what you call royal generosity. That's what kings do. Like, the, he, they understand something. What he testified this last time, he's never told me this story. His wife said to him, you need to tell Pastor M the story. So he told us the story. He said, I've never told you this. But he said, from the month that we gave that million, from the month that we gave you that gift, our personal, he said, their personal part of it, and he shared with us what the personal part. But he said, from the time we gave that, we had just come off, he had also come off the salary at Worship Harvest uh, two months before uh, the time they gave me that gift. But he said from the time we gave you that gift, our income has doubled and has stayed consistent for the last year. And he says we can't explain it. There's nothing we did. It is completely divine. But he said there's something about blessing a man of God that we have understood that has changed our lives. And he said, that is a testimony of my whole executive team. Wow. So I'm just telling you this because Pastor Kilonzi was there when he heard this story. I was in shock. And they said, we don't know about Mavuno people, but us guys, we know anointing. Yeah. So if your people don't want it, we will receive it. We want it! That's, that's, <laughs> but, you, but, but you heard him say that. Yes. That's what they said. <laughs> I built another house. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. People, 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 there's something divine here that I don't want you to miss. Pastor Aggie and Sam, let me embarrass Pastor Aggie. Pastor Aggie is my daughter. She's a Mavunite through and through, but she got married to Pastor Sam from Worship Harvest, so we gave her away. I, 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 you know, fathers giving away daughters is hard, eh? You want to call them your son name, but they have another son name now. So they've planted a worship harvest church. Broke my heart because I really thought she'd plant a Mavuno church. But I blessed it with all my heart. Because even me, if my daughter gets married and then starts using my son name, I'll tell her rubbish. That's, that's feminist rubbish. You're married. You're in another house. Recognize your spiritual authority. So she went into her spiritual authority. Um, and now they're flourishing in their church. But when I said I'm building that house, Pastor Agi said, we're bringing you a gift. Pastor Aggie, I'm going to embarrass you, but you're my daughter, so I can afford to do that. And Pastor Aggie and her husband bought us a cooker that we're using in our house right now. Like, these guys are a young couple. I want to let you know, they're a young couple, like just starting out in their careers. Huh? I was in shock. I was like, what is this? Like, this is a royal gift. Like, this is a kingly gift. Like, it, was a, it completely floored us. But like I said, their church has understood something about kingdom generosity that it still baffles me to this day. Like they get it as a church. And I realize people, I and Pastor Carol, we've practiced this in our lives. The mistake we've made is we haven't taught it. And as a result, I don't see my children prospering like I'm prospering. So I'm, I'm teaching you the things that we practice. Uh, we bless our pastor. Uh, Bishop Oscar, if you ask him right now, he has a big church with many pastors in it. But I bet you if you went and asked him, who are your spiritual sons, Bishop Oscar? I suspect my name would be one of the first ones in his mind, even though I'm very far from him. 
But part of the reason is because we learned a long time ago, we bless our pastor. There's an anointing. I told you there's an anointing he had in his life, and I wanted that anointing. And I just began to bless. We started sending him gifts. Every Christmas, we'd send him a goat, or actually two goats. Every Christmas, we'd visit him and bless him. Then it became beyond that, and we just found ways to bless him. We look for ways to bless him. And we've sent some royal gifts to them and been a blessing to them as well. And guess what has happened? As we bless them, the same anointing that they have. They have an anointing. Bishop Oscar never thinks about money. <laughs> He's like God's child. You know those guys who are God's child, and then God just blesses you with millions, and you're like, how? he even looks clueless. Like, how did I get all this money? <laughs> that guy has never, he never touches the church. His, his integrity levels are super high. Like, not only does he not want to do wrong, he doesn't even want to be seen to do wrong. So he stays far from church finances. They're run by professionals. I love his level of integrity. Pastor Hondachi has also worked for him. He can testify with what I'm saying. But he has an ease about finances. And we said, Lord, we want that ease. And I told you today, I testified. We actually are very easy when it comes to money. God has really blessed us. Uh, I am retired <laughs> financially. I'll never retire from ministry, by the way. I'll be your pastor. I'm planning to be your pastor for a long time. Don't worry. I'm not going anywhere. I love this church. You're my family. I'm not going anywhere. All I just said is, I don't have to be paid to work. I can work because I love serving this family. And in that, by the way, even that is generosity, isn't it? Yes. Because every month, our salary, we used to tithe 10%. Now we give a whole, we give 100% of it to Mavuno Church. But we've never lacked. As I've said, our income has grown as a result. So I want to just challenge you, God's people, that in this season, that you would just begin to practice generosity. Start taking baby steps. You don't have to start where we are. Just start begin. We took baby steps. We're like, next year we'll do 11%, 12%. We started doing our fast fruit offering. Uh, we'd give a salary every year. And we've done, we, we, we did that for a long time. And it's like just a way of just testing God and saying, God, provide for us. Uh, during the, the count me in, the time when we were giving money to the church, we gave, we pledged. Actually, we pledged uh, a gift of 5 million shillings. It was just by faith. We had never pledged such a huge amount. God provided it. The day we came and brought it to the church, God told us, pledge double that amount. <laughs> Guys, we pledged 10 million shillings to Mavuno Church for Count Me In to buy this property. Five and then 10. Last year during COVID, we finished our 10. Wow. We finished paying it. Uh, it's taken us a while, but 10 million is not a little money. <laughs> but we paid it. By the way, we had a, I, was, I had a party. I was like, yes! In the year of COVID, when everybody's struggling, I built a house and I paid. My, I finished paying off how much money I owed Mavuno Church. I can tell you that for me, my prayer has been that I'll be the biggest giver of this church, my wife and I. We'll be the biggest givers. Why? Because we want the... And? And you will follow. And you will follow. <laughs> because I want the biggest blessing in this church. And I want to see people reached by Jesus because of my money. I don't want to be in those places where you're seeing Westerners being sent to, sa to save Africans because somehow they have a way of starting foundations and giving their money to help people. Why? Why do we need those people? We have resources. We just need to develop a heart of generosity. My goodness, there's a Rockefeller Foundation. There's a Ford Foundation. Maybe one day there'll be a Moravi Foundation. Yeah. Blessing children in Afghanistan and other places. You know? Fearless, okay, Fearless Foundation. It's our Fearless Foundation. It'll be our family foundation. We'll do it together. But really what we're saying, guys, is we can. We can exceed in generosity. So I want to leave it there. I really believe, by the way, that all our campuses, with the people who are in this church, God has given us everything we need to not only have comfort in terms of running the services well, reaching all our programs, but even to send missionaries to the ends of the earth. Amen. There's enough resource in this church. But I believe part of what must happen is God's people must come to God like this. We must become those people who understand, my goodness. Part of the reason we have poverty is a poverty mentality. When I start having an abundance mentality, I'm like, God, this is yours. Use it. Glorify yourself. Boom. Guess what starts to happen? Some of my children, by the way, are already living like that. I can tell. I can, I can already see some changes in some of their finances. And I believe that this is God's blessing for this whole church. Amen. Amen. Stand up for one second. Just stand up for one second. Mm. Okay. Okay. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our tea. Is it ready, by the way? Yes. So we'll take our tea. We'll come back. We'll do our last session. Actually, we'll come in with our tea. 
we'll make it a working tea. <laughs> Is that okay? So we'll come in, we'll do our tea. I'll, I'll, I'll teach the last session, then we'll have communion together. And part of what communion is, I'll explain a bit about that, but I believe it's extremely significant today that we, 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 we do it together as a family. Communion was actually a family meal in the Bible. And so it's not going to be a ritual. We're not going to be doing a ritual today. We're going to be sharing it as a family meal. And so when you come back, we're going to do that, and then we're going to dismiss uh, at some point. <laughs> at some point. But remember, next year it's four days. So this one, we're just, building, we're just building muscles right now. So don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. We're just, what is rain? See, we've prayed for rain. So don't be, don't be afraid of rain. Even if it rains, we'll still go home. There's no curfew. We'll still make it. And we'll give each other lifts. Amen. Anybody who needs a lift, will just indicate and we'll give each other lifts home. And if you don't get a lift, you can sleep here. There's even church tomorrow. Uh, we, can, we, we can give you a mattress. We just find you here. Father, I thank you so much for your family. And Lord, I'm praying that as we practice these rhythms, as we become the people who practice prayer and evangelism and visitation and teaching and, and, and healing, that Lord, that will become the bread for your children and generosity. Yes. My Father, I'm just praying that, Father, this coming year, 2020 will, 2022, will be the most amazing year of our lives. And Lord, we are prepared. We are positioned for miracles. We're not just asking for them. We are positioning ourselves for them. And I'm praying that, Father God, none of these families will be the same. Hey, Lord, the blessing of this house is peace. The blessing of this house is God's blessings that add no sorrow to them. And, Lord, we are trusting you and believing you that this is our portion. And so even as we take our tea, bless it to our bodies, sanctify it to us, give us the muscles and the strength to finish this thing well. And, Lord, to see your glory, because that's what we're here to do, is to see your glory. For we ask in Jesus' name, and God's people say it. Amen. amen, amen, amen. So please grab your tea, do a bathroom break, and then be here as quickly as you can. Just turn it around and come back as quickly as you can.